Okay, I think we'll get started. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, good afternoon and, and welcome to this, what's technically the second iteration of TACOR Tuesday, uh, though this one's a little bit more robust and I'm, I'm happy to see it growing and evolving. Uh, we are recording the sessions today because though it's great to be here in person, uh, we want to make sure we preserve this and can have people who aren't able to join check later on. So uh, be sure to, when you're speaking, speak clearly so we can hear you uh, and not quite as fast as I usually do. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Andrew Bernard and I'm the director of our centralized core facilities here at UMass Amherst. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here again. Uh, but before I go any further and talk about the day and what we'll be doing, I just want to make sure I pause to say thank you. Uh, first and foremost, Elisa Korpieski, who should be around, uh, who organized the majority of this while I was off playing on boats for the last few months. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, to Joanne Chauvin, who's also hiding out somewhere, but does a lot, lot of the logistics for us and is why you should make sure you come back for the uh, dinner portion later on and uh, dinner and drinks, which will be great. Uh, Emily Schedule, who unfortunately can't be here with us today, IELTS Director of Finance and Marketing, who does a tremendous amount to support all of us uh, at the cores, at the university, and uh, we just all be lost without her. Pat Lujulier, Aaron Nugent, and Charlene Coleman, who are playing a support role today, who are the CORE's accounting team. Nick Lekrahowski, who I don't know is here today, also another tremendous asset, and who you want to call when you need help in a pinch. Uh, Peter Reinhardt, for all the support you give to the CORE's, making sure we are here and that we have what we need to be successful. Um, I want to wel welcome Janet Glick, who's uh, on board for all of 24 hours, I think, at this point. Welcome to the, to the fire. Janet's going to be filling a role that supports the centers, which is the next group I'd like to, to thank. And I think we have some center representation here, but the centers really drive the research that we do within and, and throughout aisles. Um, and Janet's going to be uh, learning a lot about them and playing a big supportive role. Um, and most importantly, as a core facilities directors and staff, who uh, this is all for and, and why I'm here and why it's great to come here every day. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for making sure you provide tremendous world-class resources to the university and well beyond. Uh, and I hope that you have some fun today, too, with uh, being here and, and making sure we present what you all are doing. So um, the purpose today is really a, an expansion of our seminar series. For the last, I think, four semesters now, we've had an ongoing uh, weekly or, or bi-weekly seminar from each of the cores where you get to learn a little bit about what they do, uh, figure out how you can interact and, and really accelerate your research. So today's a chance to do that on a much broader scale. And more impactfully in my mind is making sure we hear from some students who have worked with the cores to see the work that they do um, and the impact it's had on their research. Uh, as the day goes on, we'll have a poster session. You can see the agenda up there right now. Strongly encourage you not only to go talk to the cores and see how you can work with them, but see what some of your, your peers have done in the core facilities and how it might accelerate your research to, to add aspects you haven't in the past. A lot of folks think of IELTS and they just think life sciences, but we really are broad across a wide range and a wide array of resources that uh, affect everything from the cellular level all the way up to whole human and a whole cohort of, of manufacturing and engineering type capabilities in the middle. So if you think aisles and you think core facilities and you only think life science, it's really just the, 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 the tip of the tail. Um, all of our stuff is on the website. Strongly encourage you to go there. Again, people think aisles and they think this building, the LSL, but really we are across campus and across the five campuses and with our partnerships at the other UMass campuses. So uh, if you haven't worked with maybe one more than one core facility, strongly encourage you to learn what else they can do and, and, and work with us in finding ways to get to, uh, more hands-on experience. Um, we have a really robust virtual tour. We love giving tours. I'm a little bit rusty. It's been a while since I gave some. But if you, again, haven't worked with the cores, if you have peers at other institutions, uh, if you have mentors, if you have folks anywhere, industry or academia, that want to learn about us, this is a quick way to at least see physically what we look like. Um, there's a chance to go into the cores. A lot of the content we've generated over the years is on these websites. So if you've given, us, uh, given a talk for us or uh, seen a talk that you might want to see, you can go through the virtual tour and find it in the facility you'd like to have more engagement with. Uh, for those who are on the undergraduate level or who work with undergraduates, uh, we're going to be hosting the, the core summer internship again uh, in 23. We're very excited for that. We're a little bit behind in advertising, but the uh, website right there, uh, IELTS slash CSI, has all the information and very soon we'll have applications. So please, if you are an undergraduate, work with undergraduates or know UMass undergraduates that might be interested, please encourage them to check it out. Uh, and we'll have, I think, quite a few positions available for them uh, in the coming year. That's my, my thousand mile an hour overview of the cores. Just to let you know, again, if you've worked with one of our cores, it's really just the very beginning of what we can do. Uh, IELTS as a whole has quite a lot of other resources from entrepreneurship uh, opportunities uh, to training and mentorship. So um, do go to our website after today. Make sure you engage with, with the posters. Spend some time talking to folks. See what you can do to, to, to uh, learn more. And this is going to be a judge poster session. So uh, if you are a poster presenter, please make sure you're by the posters at that time so our judges can engage with you. 
Um, at 3.30, we're going to have a plenary talk by Lila Garish, who if you haven't worked with, you haven't been at UMass very long, she is engaged in everything that we do um, and was really institution, uh, uh, in, uh, involved in the founding of the cores and has been a, a key contributor since. Um, we'll wrap up the plenary. We'll have Q&A with all the folks who are here to talk today. And then we have dinner and networking at 4.30. Again, uh, thanks to Joanne. I would strongly encourage you to come back for that. If you can't stay the whole day, make sure you engage with everybody and get some good food and drinks later on. Uh, the post presentations will be at 5.15. So times I'd really ask you to make sure you're back here at 3.30 so you can hear Lila speak, and at 5.15 so we can make sure we, uh, we, we honor those who have uh, had some great presentations here. Um, so with that, I'll invite up Michelle Klingbell to introduce uh, Stephen for our first presentation. Uh, Stephanie, apologies. Okay, so while Andrew's getting that set up, what I'd like to do is just take a couple of moments and describe a little bit about Stephanie Dalzell. She's a senior graduate student in my lab. And for any of you who know anything about me and my lab, I really like Arthur Kornberg. You'll, you'll hear a little bit why, maybe. Um, family A DNA polymerases, I'll, I'll give that away. Um, Stephanie started um, in my lab on a different project and she moved into the project that she's going to be talking about. She ended up doing some undergraduate research at Bridgewater State University where she actually worked on a different family A DNA polymerase, T7 DNA polymerase. So it was a little um, fortuitous that she came to my lab and was able to further study um, family A DNA polymerases. I was told that I'm not allowed to embarrass her too much, but I have three or two really strong words that describe Stephanie and what she has brought to my lab. She has brought a level of professionalism, and right now Stephanie is not just um, a graduate student, she's an instructor of record for two laboratory courses in the microbiology department, so sort of wearing two hats at the same time. And another word that really describes Stephanie is perseverance. And so the project that she's going to be talking about was true perseverance through COVID pandemic and every single hurdle that you could imagine was put in her way and she still plowed through it um, for the beautiful work that she's going to present. All right. Thank you for introducing me, Michelle. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about a mitochondrial DNA polymerase from the African trypanosomes, Trypanosoma brucei. This enzyme, PAL1B, exhibits a kind of tug of war between two activities that I'm going to tell you about later in this presentation. So the reason that African trypanosomes are so important to study is that they cause devastating disease in both humans and animals in sub-Saharan Africa. These parasites are transmitted to mammalian hosts through the bite of a tsetse fly, where they're able to establish infection in the mammalian bloodstream, and they're also able to cross the blood-brain barrier and cause severe neurological symptoms. Trypanosomiasis always results in death if it's left untreated. And we've made great strides in controlling human African trypanosomiasis in Africa, but animal African trypanosomiasis has proven to be more difficult to control because they Panosomes are able to persist in wildlife animal populations and reinfect critical livestock in Africa. There's an estimated loss of $4.5 billion annually in the African agriculture industry caused by animal African trypanosomiasis. And so there's always a need for the discovery of novel trypanocidal therapies for us to be able to better control this problem. Our favorite way to think about potential um, treatments for trypanosomiasis are by thinking about their specialized divergent uh, biological features that we can study to be potential drug targets. Our favorite divergent biological feature in African trypanosomes is their mitochondrial DNA structure. This is called kinetoplast DNA or kDNA. And we can see in the schematic that this kDNA is located close in close proximity to the flagellar basal body. And when we look at electron micrographs of this structure, we can see that it's condensed into a disc hockey puck shaped structure. And so here in this micrograph, we're seeing that from the side. When we isolate that network from the cell, we can see that it's made up of catenated circular DNA molecules. They're catenated like medieval chain mail. And when we decatenate these molecules from each other, we can see that the network is made up of two different DNA species. So there are dozens of these 23 KB maxi circles, as well as thousands of 1 KB D DNA mini circles. Maintenance of this mitochondrial DNA structure is critical for the survival of the parasite. 
And replication of this network is, requires a complex process. So this process includes the release of mini circles from the network to be replicated, and once they're successfully replicated, they reattach to the network at the network peripheries. This process involves several sets of DNA replication protein paralogs, including the set of paralogs that we're most interested in in the Kling Biolab, the set of four PAL1-like polymerases that belong to the family A of DNA polymerases. To establish hypotheses for what the separate roles of these PAL1-like polymerases could be, we can look at other family A DNA polymerases from across life. These polymerases have a variety of different roles in different organisms, including uh, organellar DNA replication and organellar DNA repair. In Trypanosoma brucei, there are five of these family A DNA polymerases, four of which localize to the mitochondrion, and three of which have been determined to be independently essential via RNAi studies. And what I want to point out to you here is this highly uh, intriguing domain arrangement of Pol1b, where the three to five prime exonuclease is actually embedded in the conserved polymerase domain. So to understand what that might mean for the structure of Pol1b, we can look at a well-characterized member of this DNA polymerase family A. So I'm showing you here the crystal structure of E. coli Pol1 clanout fragment. So you can see that these polymerases fold up into a right-hand shaped structure and that the three to five prime exonuclease domain is <laughs> underneath the palm domain. When we look at the de novo protein structure prediction of PAL1b downloaded from the AlphaFold database, we can first see a large gray N-terminal region that doesn't have homology to other characterized enzymes. When we remove that domain, we can see that conserved right-hand structure in teal, but with a distinct variation. There's a 369 amino acid insertion in the thumb subdomain that has homology to the DNAQ superfamily of exonucleases. And so here I have highlighted in magenta the conserved catalytic residues for exonuclease activity. So this is a pretty divergent predicted structure for this polymerase, and we were really interested in what this meant for the activity of PAL1b. So in order to test the activity of PAL1b, we first need to design a recombinant protein. So here I'm showing you the truncated, histagged, E. coli codon optimized variant of PAL1b that we designed. We, this is expressed in E. coli. And then I use my favorite instrument on campus, the OctaPure and the bioproduction and separation core to purify this protein. And I'm not just saying that because this is an IELTS talk. I'm very excited to show you the Kamasi gel on this slide. Um, so I use a two-step purification scheme where I take advantage of that his tag to use nickel column uh, uh, purification. And then I can take the eluate from that nickel column purification and load it onto a quaternary ammonium column and dilute off with a salt gradient. And so here I can, you can see these pure fractions that I can then pool and use in a variety of assays downstream. So that's one aspect of the project that could not have happened without IELTS. <laughs> and then um, we also purify some other enzymatic variants of PAL1b, including an exo minus variant that has catalytic active site mutations in the exo exonuclease domain, as well as a PAL minus variant that has catalytic active site residue mutations in the polymerase domain. And so here I'm showing you some sample purifications of those other variants. And we can test the activity of these variants in reactions that include a five prime fluorescently labeled 22 nucleotide primer annealed to an unlabeled template. We can see changes in size of this primer by running them on a sequencing gel. And then I can image the sequencing gel using the Typhoon imager and the biophysical characterization core. The first question we wanted to ask with this recombinant protein was whether or not that insertion was indeed an active exonuclease domain. And so here you can see th from the buildup of degradation products by the wild type protein that this is indeed an active exonuclease domain. And this activity is ablated in the exo minus variant. Interestingly, Paul, the Paul minus variant seems to have reduced exonuclease activity and this suggests that there's likely crosstalk between these two domains. So this exonuclease activity as part of a polymerase domain, we expected that it was likely acting as a proofreading domain. And to test this, we uh, quantified the rate of removal of a matched nucleotide compared to a mismatched terminal nucleotide. 
And this data I'm showing you on this slide is also quantified from gels that were imaged with the Typhoon imager. We did see here that there was no significance in the removal rate of a matched compared to a mismatched template. And so we concluded that it's not likely that this exonuclease domain is acting in a proofreading capacity. We also tested the exonuclease activity on other substrates, so now including single-stranded DNA as well as blunt double-stranded DNA. And we saw that Paul-1b is capable of degrading all of these substrates, but degrades single-stranded DNA more rapidly than any other substrate we tested. We also tested the exonuclease activity on single-stranded RNA as well as RNA-DNA hybrid substrates. And we saw here, again, that Paul-1b is capable of degrading all of these substrates, indicating that it has a broad substrate range, but that it has a preference for those single-stranded oligos. So now we wanted to look into the polymerase activity of this protein. So now these assays include deoxyribonucleotides in the reaction mix. And we started by looking at the activity at pH 8, which we expected to be physiologically relevant for the mitochondrion in T. brucei. Here, however, you're seeing a buildup of degradation products over time, but only very few faint extension products. When we reduce the pH to pH 7, we start to see some more uh, extension products accumulating. And when we reduce the pH even farther to 6, now we can see a preference for extension over degradation using the wild-type protein. So we hypothesized that this was likely due to two separate two distinct pH optimums for the two activities of Paul-1b, and so we wanted to test them separately across pH conditions. So here I'm showing you degradation activity over pH conditions using the wild-type protein in the absence of deoxyribonucleotides, and you can see that it's optimal at pH 7, but is more stable at basic pHs than acidic ones. When we test extension activity across pH conditions using the exo minus variant in the presence of deoxyribonucleotides, we can see that the activity is more stable over acidic pHs, but uh, is reduced about twofold at, basic, at more basic pHs. So we can think about the relationship between these two activities like this scale, where at more basic and neutral pHs, exonuclease activity prevails over extension activity. And at more acidic pHs, polymerase activity, the scale tips into favor of polymerase activity. And so we hypothesized that this might mean that Paul-1b's activity could be regulated in vivo based on its localization in different microclimates. And that's something that we would be interested in testing in the future. We also considered that maybe Paul-1b would be a better uh, polymerase with a more natural substrate. So we wanted to test its activity on a RNA-primed DNA template. And so with the wild-type protein, you can see that there are indeed more um, extension products accumulating from the RNA primer compared to the DNA primer. And we also tested its ability to incorporate ribonucleotides, but we didn't see um, efficient extension with ribonucleotides in either condition, although it does appear to incorporate some from an RNA primer. When we quantify the rate of extension over time, we can clearly see that Paul-1b is more efficiently extending from an RNA primer with deoxyribonucleotides than a DNA primer. We hypothesize that this means it could be playing a role similar to nuclear Paul-alpha that extends briefly from an RNA polymerase in nuclear DNA replication. We also wanted to make sure that these properties of Paul-1b that we were seeing weren't a function of the truncation that we made for the recombinant protein. So we also immunoprecipitated full-length Paul-1b as well as the other Paul-1-like proteins from trypanosome cell lines. And what we put into this assay is actually the beads, the IgG beads still bound to the protein, and these assays are not as carefully controlled for enzyme concentration as the other assays that I showed you. So on this gel, you can see that there are fully extended products from Paul-1a, Paul-1c, and Paul-1d, but we can only see some faint extension products in the exo-dead variant of Paul-1b. And these are all at pH 8, so we did want to test Paul-1b's activity at lower pHs and also with that RNA primer. Interestingly, the full-length protein, we don't see improved extension at lower pHs, but with the RNA primer, we are still seeing uh, more robust extension from this full-length protein. 
So these data tell us that Pol1b is not likely the replicative polymerase involved in kDNA replication, but it does give us some ideas of what it could be doing in vivo. So as I alluded to briefly on, the, on a previous slide, uh, nuclear Pol alpha has a known role in extending an RNA primer with deoxyribonucleotides before handing off the DNA for replication by a more processive DNA polymerase. Pol1b could be playing a similar role in kDNA replication, in which case the replosome would look something like this. We would get unwinding of the DNA by one of the pif one like helicases in the mitochondrion. We would get laying down of an RNA primer with PRI1 or PRI2. Extension of that RNA primer with deoxyribonucleotides by Pol1b, and then handing off for more processive replication by Pol1d or another processive enzyme in the mitochondrion. I also think that that exonuclease activity that is often outcompeting extension is likely an important role of Pol1b. And so we can look to one of the roles of the 3 to 5 prime exonuclease in the mammalian mitochondrial DNA polymerase, Pol gamma. This polymerase has an, a 3 to 5 prime exonuclease domain that's critical for the degradation of linearized mitochondrial DNA molecules alongside a 5 to 3 prime exonuclease, MGME1. Pol1b could be playing a similar role in this cleanup of linearized molecules that are byproducts of unsuccessful kDNA replication. And finally, this research is uh, important to the kinetoplastid field as a whole because these four Pol1-like polymerases are conserved throughout kinetoplastids, and these include other parasitic species that infect humans and cause Chagas disease or Leishmaniasis. And the four polymerases are not conserved in other related protists, including glenids. So this suggests that the kinetoplastids have some conserved mechanisms of maintenance of their mitochondrial DNA. And this leads us to open questions in the field, which are, are these divergent protein structures potentially good drug targets? What is the precise division of labor among these four paralogs? And is the role of Pol1b conserved in all of these kinetoplastid species? Ooh. So with that, I would like to thank um, the people in my lab who have contributed to this project, our collaborator at Iowa State University, Scott Nelson. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, the two presenters we have today were selected amongst all of our speakers and the abstracts that were submitted. Uh, the core director spent time looking through and seeing what really exemplified uh, using the core is what it can do, and, and these two speakers were, were chosen among that group. So uh, both will receive a $500 travel award from IELTS, um, and we're, we're grateful to be able to have them go on to uh, spread the work that they're doing and spread the name of, of uh, UMass as they go. Um, and likewise, for the poster session as well, there'll be awards from each of the centers uh, that are each poster that represents what the centers are working on uh, most exemplary. So again, come back later on 515. We'll see from some of those uh, uh, posters and hopefully hear them later on. Um, I also just want to let folks know that came in, there's a registration desk out front, so if you didn't go there, just make sure you do get your name tag. We can make sure everybody that is here should be here. And I'll say we're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, I'd like to forge ahead just because I know how things typically go. Um, if that gets us to a little bit earlier, folks can have a, a break and then go to the poster sessions early. So um, with that, I'll load up your slides, uh, Timothy, and Mindy, if you want to come up and thank you. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, T. Merman. Uh, he's a senior undergrad in, in my lab. Um, and he's been in my lab since January 2020. And if it sounds to you like January 2020 was like last week and at the same time five years ago, it's because in between, you know, there was this big pandemic. So imagine being an undergrad starting in the lab two months before the entire world is being shut down. So. You know, this was kind of a test, uh, but Tim definitely uh, persisted. He was the first undergrad back in the lab, uh, and he was right, perfectly ready to start working on this project. And so what we do in my lab, if you don't know, is we study viruses. Not any viruses, but viruses that cause cancer. And so we are trying to identify antiviral factors that can prevent the spread of those viruses. And so when, whenever we do an experiment, there's a lot going on. You know, our virus is trying to kill our cells. The cells are trying to survive. There's a lot of factors being triggered, a lot of factors being repressed. And so any kind of experiment that we do is a big mess, basically. And I think one of the great strengths of Tim is to make sense out of his experiment and you will see it in this presentation, um, and I hope you'll enjoy his story. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mandy, for the kind words. I very much appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for coming to my talk today. Uh, my name's Tim. I'm a senior undergraduate in Mandy's lab. And today, I'm going to be telling you about the work I do in this lab studying the host defense protein shiftless and the KSHV viral protein, or 57. But I'm sure you're all wondering, well, what is KSHV? Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus is a gamma herpes virus that causes its namesake illness, Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma is a particularly aggressive form of skin cancer, but KSHV can also cause several B cell lymphomas as well. Like any herpes virus, KSHV's life cycle is biphasic, consisting of a latent phase where the viral genome is maintained inside of the host nucleus, and a lytic phase where virions are actively being produced inside of the cell. Our lab is particularly interested in studying the lytic phase. Um, as you might imagine, uh, the lytic phase is a nightmare for the cell. Uh, the virus very much uh, hijacks host processes and remodels many different things inside of the cell. While studying this remodeling, we identified one host protein named Shiftless. Shiftless is an interferon-stimulated gene. Its expression is actually upregulated by interferon alpha. And it has been shown to restrict a very broad pool of viruses, RNA viruses, retroviruses, and DNA viruses as well. Um, this includes chikungunya virus, HIV virus, and many different ones. In fact, its name um, comes from its restriction of HIV-1. HIV-1 uh, uses a programmed ribosomal frame shift to encode some of its genes, and shiftless, as you might have guessed, restricts that. Um, shiftless has been shown to have a number of different functions inside of the cell, including RNA binding, um, RNA stability and translation modulation, and it has also influenced the stability of um, viral proteins. So uh, our group was actually um, one of the first groups to show that shiftless can restrict a DNA virus, of course, KSHV. And specifically, we were able to show that shiftless restricts um, viral protein products. Um, it does this uh, in protein products throughout the entire KSHV life cycle. Uh, we, of course, were extremely interested in figuring out the uh, precise mechanism by which shiftless does this. And our first step towards figuring out this mechanism was determining which proteins, both host and viral, uh, shiftless can interact with. So to do this, we used uh, the core facilities here to do um, immunoprecipitation mass spectrometry through LC-MS-MS, which gave us this wonderful interactome for the proteins that shiftless interacts with. Um, we found a very diverse pool of proteins here. We found um, RNA binding proteins, which is exciting for us because it's kind of a confirmation that this worked. Uh, shiftless is known to have RNA binding capacity. Um, we also found ubiquitin ligase binding proteins, which is also exciting because um, this kind of pointed to a possible mechanism here where perhaps it is a protein uh, degradation based mechanism. But perhaps most excitingly, we found that shiftless interacts with three viral proteins. That's OR52, which is a KSHV tagament protein, uh, OR59, which is the viral DNA processivity factor and the viral protein that I am most fond of, OR57. Um, but what is OR57? Uh, OR57 is the master regulator of KSHV RNA. It has many functions, including uh, helping RNA be exported from the nucleus, RNA stability, and it even plays uh, roles in RNA translation during KSHV infection. Uh, OR57 has been shown to be uh, absolutely vital for virus replication, so if we were able to show that shiftless uh, were to inhibit OR57 protein levels, uh, this might explain how shiftless has such cascading effects through uh, KSHV's life cycle. I also confirmed the interaction that we did here via mass spec using co-immunoprecipitation. We wanted to uh, visually see that the interaction was happening via Western blot. To do this, I repeated the immunoprecipitation that we did for the mass spec, but ran the proteins through Western blotting instead. And what we find is that when we pull down on shiftless, we get a very good pull down. You can see that very large band there. But also, we have a very strong interaction with OR57, which is shown by that very thick band highlighted in red there. However, knowing that OR57 and shiftless both have RNA binding capacity, we wanted to see whether or not this interaction was also RNA dependent, as this would be uh, in line with our previous knowledge with both of these proteins. What we find is that when we repeat this co-immunoprecipitation in the presence of an RNase, so a molecule that breaks down RNA, we're still very much able to pull down on shiftless successfully, but there is no longer any OR57 that comes down with it, or there's not very much at all. So 
this interaction appears to us to be very um, much RNA dependent. Um, and this is kind of where um, we have this model emerging where uh, shiftless and OR57 are localizing on the same RNA molecule. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that shiftless is restricting OR57. So that was then our next step. We overexpress both of these proteins in HEK 293T cells uh, to see whether or not the presence of shiftless uh, decreases the amount of OR57 that we find in the system. And what we find is that when we overexpress shiftless alongside OR57, uh, there is a, a significantly less amount of OR57. We have a quantification for that Western law right there. However, very interestingly, when we do the same experiment and look at OR57 uh, RNA levels, ooh, sorry, um, we find that there is no impact on OR57 RNA. Um, this to us would suggest that this is either a translation-based mechanism, as translation is between RNA and protein, and, uh, or it could be a protein degradation-based mechanism. Uh, we next wanted to see whether or not these two proteins uh, co-localize alongside each other inside of the cell. Here I have a um, wonderful confocal microscopy image that was also taken here at the core. Um, we have DAPI, which is just our general DNA stain, stains for our nucleus. Um, we're using a uh, N-terminal tagged version of shiftless here. It's tagged um, with an RFP named M. Cherry. Uh, we have OR57, which is in that cyan color there, and we have the merge between all of them. And unfortunately, you guys probably can't see in that white box there, but I can blow it up for you. Uh, there appears to be very clear co-localization between these two proteins in the cytoplasm. So that also kind of uh, lends credence to this model that we have emerging of these two proteins perhaps um, interacting with each other and leading to the degradation of OR57's protein. Uh, next, we really wanted to dive into that mechanism of protein degradation, as most of our results up until this point were really pointing towards protein degradation. So to do this, um, we wanted to see whether or not uh, the proteasome was required for protein degradation. So this is one of the most common routes inside of the cell uh, that proteins undergo to be degraded. Uh, again, we kind of have this model going now where um, shiftless and OR57 are localizing on this RNA molecule, and perhaps a E3 ubiquitin ligase uh, results in the ubiquination of OR57, and then its subsequent degradation by the proteasome. So in order to test whether or not the proteasome was required for degradation here, um, we used a assay that involves MG132, which is a well-known inhibitor of the proteasome. Essentially, uh, our reasoning was is that if we inhibit the proteasome, we should see an accumulation of OR57 protein if the proteasome is required for that phenotype that you guys saw earlier. Um, however, if um, we still see the restriction phenotype, uh, that would suggest to us that even when we restrict the proteasome, um, it's not really having a role in OR57's degradation. And what we find is that when we treat with MG132, um, that phenotype very much goes away. Um, so this would really strongly suggest to us that, that the proteasome is uh, required for OR57's protein degradation. And as you can see here in our negative control, uh, the phenotype is very much still present. And I have a quantification there. Um, although this was only one replicate, this was done very recently, we do need to do more replicates, but um, it appears that uh, that phenotype is very much restored. So next, um, yeah. Does shiftless uh, protein levels decrease as well? No, no, so shiftless, when we treat with MG132, it appears yeah. that shiftless's protein levels stay about constant. Um, yes. So going back to our uh, interaction web here, um, our next step, knowing that uh, it appears that the proteasome is involved with this. We wanted to see, um, well, what protein could be mediating that uh, ubiquination of OR57. And as you guys know, we pulled down on a number of ubiquitin ligase binding proteins, but actually, um, we pulled down on a E3 ubiquitin ligase that's involved with RNA binding, um, which is also kind of leading um, to that idea that perhaps there's this complex being recruited on an RNA molecule, shiftless thereby recruits a E3 ligase, which then results in 57 being ubiquinated and degraded. Um, so again, we wanted to confirm this interaction visually, and what we find is when we pull down on shiftless here, uh, there is a very strong interaction with TRIM21. So that was very exciting for us, because this could be that E3 ligase that would feed into our model here. So we have this model where um, perhaps TRIM21 is either associating directly with the shiftless protein or with the RNA molecule that it is attached to, and thereby ubiquitating OR57 and leading to its degradation. So for future directions, um, we really would like to confirm that OR57 is being ubiquinated, and in particular being ubiquinated by TRIM21. 
And we also want to see whether or not that this is um, RNA-dependent ubiquination, which is uh, somewhat common. And uh, this would also be in line with TRIM21's RNA binding capacity. We also want to determine uh, whether or not there are further viral or human genes which are required for shift directed ubiquination and also restriction of KSHB. I want to say thank you to my PI, Mandy Muller, and uh, my graduate student mentor, William Rodriguez, as well as everyone at the core who has made my research possible. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, so we're going to go off to the poster session now. I think there are still some refreshments if you'd like. Uh, please, again, make sure you take time to go talk to the, both the core directors and the folks who have posters out there. Uh, if you are a poster presenter, the, we told the judges 2.30, so there'll be another few minutes um, if you need to get ready or, or prep or take a bio break. Um, be back here at 3.30 to hear Lila speak, and then again, awards uh, and dinner and networking starting at 4.30. So thank you all. I'm delighted to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Professor uh, Lila Girash. Um, Lila is a distinguished professor on our campus, and she has a large list of honors and awards that I'm not going to go through, or else we'll spend many minutes here. But I do want to name a few. Uh, she's a Sloan Fellow. She's a Triple AS Fellow. Uh, she's received the Mira Award. Um, she was, until recently, editor in chief of the Journal of Biological Chemistry very premier journal that's difficult to get into, as I know. I put some of my submissions there, and they get pretty tough reviews. Uh, a few years ago, she was also elected to the National Academy of Sciences, so uh, uh, definitely uh, a lot of uh, awards. But uh, for me, there are actually two aspects of Lila that I find in really impressive. Um, the first is the achievements that have come out of her lab. Um, Working on understanding protein folding and trafficking is really difficult. As I know, I've been in two biotech companies that have tried this very hard, um, even on simple proteins. And to do it on a complicated machine like HSP70 and make headway in it is, is really amazing to me. So that's a really tremendous set of achievements that have come out of her lab. The, uh, the second impressive aspect is much simpler to talk about and much harder to do, which is Lila's a really nice person. Sometimes, you know, people that are really uh, uh, leaders in the scientific field sometimes lose some of that uh, nice personality. But uh, Lila hasn't. She really cares about people. She cares about her environment. And she's nice to people. And I hope she's going to be nice to me as she gets through her talk. So <laughs> with that, I introduce our keynote speaker for today, Lila Gerash. It's hard to have somebody t call you nice right before you're about to make a joke about them. And, but he's not going to be here. He has to run off to something. So. So this is an unusual talk because really today is about celebrating the Institute for Applied Life Sciences and in particular the core facilities. And there are several people in the room that have been on the same journey that I will describe that, that I have experienced over the last decade. And I wanted to d give people who weren't on that journey a little background. And in order to do that, I, I did um, email archaeology. And I'm one of those people that never deletes any of their emails. So this actually turned out to be a hell of a lot of fun. Um, and it's good because they say you can't remember pain. So the painful parts. I didn't really remember, but I remembered the joy and the fun. And so you're all going to be treated to, in the beginning of this talk, uh, a little um, recapping of that journey that has led to the core facilities that you're now benefiting from and, uh, and, and what many of us went through to get that to happen. Um, obviously, the first slide is just to point out that we have core facilities in this wonderful building. 
Um, and I will get to HSP 70 and the impact of the core facilities on our research in the latter part of the talk, but I wanted to have some fun first. And it was fun for me, so I hope you like it, but it doesn't really matter because I had a kick going <laughs> through it. Anyway, so what happened uh, is we get a lot of emails on campus from higher up people in Whitmore, and many of us kind of look at them very quickly and move on. On Halloween, we got an email from our Vice Chancellor of Research, Mike Malone, and it said, as you can see, that um, basically there was this $95 million state earmark that was going to be coming to campus to improve life sciences on campus. Now, $95 million is not small change, and it's extremely unusual to, to open an email and find some reference to a dollar number like that that is just coming to us from the Massachusetts High, um, Life Sciences Center to support an improvement in, in life sciences. So once we got past the incredulity and thinking that maybe this was something that we just read wrong, um, we basically realized that we were about to, to go on quite a journey. And that was to figure out what you would do with $95 million if somebody handed it to you. What would be the best thing you could do for the life sciences on campus? There was great hoopla and celebration. That was the first thing we did, which is great. And some people will recognize the people that are sitting here. All of you hopefully will recognize our chancellor. Um, but we also had our governor and state representative. So it was, we, were, we were definitely um, cause for celebration. Then the next thing that happened, because if you think that was 2012, Halloween, okay? So we're 10 years, basically, almost to the day. Um, so what happened then was, you have to figure out how to spend money, but you have to do it with many, many people at the table. So this leads to, I can tell you from doing the email archeology, span meetings, meetings, meetings. And that went on for at least three years. Um, and it, it was, there are several people in the room who were in on many of these meetings. Um, our calendars were full. But in this way, that was just amazing. Like, how can you spend all this money? Uh, it, a good chunk of it was going to go to fit out this building, which is money well spent. It's a lovely, lovely building. And then there were others of us who said, from the get-go, whatever we do with this money, we need to improve the infrastructure for research. That's going to be the thing that will really lift the boats on campus. And this is just an email I had sent to Barbara Osborne that I found, where I said, you know, whatever we do, we're going to sit there and keep saying that we need to improve core facilities. And so what today is about is seeing that we actually were able to influence things in a way. Um, and as I say, I, I could list the people that, that were at the table that doing this. Um, but of course, we're academics and we're not really trained in how, how to budget carefully. We just are very good at thinking of dreams. And so as we went along, we were making lists of everything we wanted. And then we got this email back from Lauren Walker, one of the people who helped us out from the Vice Chancellor's Office and Research saying, um, hello, we added up your lists and you seem to be about $30 million over. So we had to then prioritize a bit more, et cetera, more meetings. Um, and we each were thinking of what we could do in terms of the, the nature of the facilities that would have the biggest impact. So there are a lot of, a lot of voices at the table but the harmony was amazing, actually. Um, and during that time, and this all predates Peter's arrival, so uh, he, has it, he didn't live through some of this, but we put our heads together on what we thought the intellectual thrusts would be that could be facilitated, that were strengths on campus, and could be facilitated by this influx of money. And that led to the um, centers as they were proposed, and now as they actually exist in 2022. We had models to medicine, bioactive delivery. Bioinformatics became more of a supporting effort and personalized health monitoring. And this is, these are the three centers that you know about under IELTS. But we didn't even have IELTS yet. Um, that happened next. I found an email from June 24th, 2013. So six months after we got the money, um, the Institute for Applied Life Sciences was, was born. Um, and that had the centers then were automatically under the umbrella of the Institute for Life Sciences, Applied Life Sciences, and the core facilities became 
IELTS cores. So all of this happened in a very, very busy six months. Um, and then the building was being worked on, so there were parallel meetings going on for those people that were involved in the architectural planning of this building that, again, Steve Isles over there nodding because he was involved in a lot of that, as were many others of us. Peter's back there. We, we met to try to fi figure out what the best architecture was, but that's not what today is about. Today's about the core facilities. It just meant that we were going to parallel meetings at all times. We did have the ribbon cutting for the building. That took place um, in November of 2013. It was quite an event. Uh, the people who were living in, many of the people who were living in this building were already in. We went in around September um, from my email digging. Uh, and our effort to think of what the core facilities should be that would support the research in aisles and those centers um, led to the identification of the list that you'll see here, which are still uh, very important cores. We've now expanded the number, but the original cores were biological NMR, imaging, which became light microscopy. Jim was heavily involved in putting that together. Biophysical characterization. I don't see Scott Garman here, but Peter and I and others thought about what you would really need if you wanted to have a, a room full of biophysical instruments that would support your research, and that's the biophysical characterization core. Mass spec which was already in existence, but got a boost, just like the biological NMR, bioproduction separation, flow cytometry, and MRI. So this is basically um, $30 million of the $95 million were spent to launch these facilities. Uh, and looking at the posters out here, you see the consequence of that is that when you want to do an experiment, you can now go to these cores and you can be supported in, in your work by terrific instrumentation. And I said that Peter wasn't even here yet when this was being done, but he actually was recruited in September 2014. And the point I made here, which he's not here, he said he'll listen to the re recording, but I want to say that that was super important because what we lacked was somebody on top who understood the importance of having these core facilities. And when he came and was the director of IELTS, one of the first things he did was to figure out how to have fi financial sustainability for the cores. And so he deserves great credit. The other wonderful thing he did was to recruit Andrew Vernard, without whom I think these core facilities you know, would be struggling greatly. And so we, hats off, Andrew. And so this is where I basically had to just say that <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, this is our Batman. And, and Robin and, and the core facilities have really benefited from having people that care about them. And, you know, we do our research. Those that were involved in those early days know how much effort we went to to think about what you need to do your research. With the, the wonder of having uh, dollars to spend, you know, just being told, here's the checkbook. Uh, what do you need? And now we're basking in the glory of that, uh, in my opinion, I think. It helps us in many, many ways. So models to medicine, which um, we call M2M, as you know, was an early theme, but it, it has uh, maintained traction uh, in the intervening decade. And the sub-themes that were um, initially proposed for models to medicine, the first was protein homeostasis, which is what I'll be talking about. And what you know, we have a number of faculty who are involved in that uh, intellectual area. But we also had biology at the membrane, cytoskeleton, cytokinesis, immunology, and development and reproduction. And the faculty grouped themselves into these uh, intellectual themes. And I put up, at the time, we were having to do a lot of what I call dog and pony shows, where you go out and you talk to people in industry and try to let the world know what you're doing. And at the time, this was the cast of characters in protein homeostasis. And what has happened in the intervening time is that we still have most of those people but we've been able to use the strength in an area, an intellectual area, to recruit more faculty. And so we have Jenny sitting right in front of us. I put her little um, mugshot up there. Uh, and even our provost came, and actually Peter came, partly because they saw this as an area that was a strength area on campus. We have other strength areas, but this was a good one as a, a showcase in the beginning. 
And, and I think it illustrated something that, that I would encourage everyone um, to take home as a message, which is that if you focus on strength areas, you attract more people to come into those strength areas. So, um, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the end of the, the introductory stuff. But I, I did find it um, quite, uh, I don't know, it was like a, 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 a nostalgic trip um, to remember the amount of effort that went on. And it's only been a decade um, since we started all of that, but it was a huge, huge amount of effort and um, a, a great deal of satisfaction. So this proteostasis theme uh, is basically what my own lab's research is on. And so I wanted to just make the point about why we care about uh, protein homeostasis, or it's come to be called proteostasis. In large measure, Proteins are functional in their folded state, and if they don't fold properly to the correct three-dimensional state, you lose their function. So this is a loss of function problem that happens when proteins misfold or when folding is inefficient. The other problem that I think all of you probably appreciate is that when proteins misfold, they go into states that have a propensity to self-associate, and that self-association can lead to at the simplest case, insolubility, but in other cases when it can become more pathological, the actual aggregates of proteins themselves are toxic. And this can lead to um, many diseases where it's clear that the presence of these aggregates is actually um, causes um, toxicity, cells die, and the cases that you guys hear about most are the neurodegenerative diseases, and we do have very active research here in these areas. But there are many diseases that are now known to have as their origin the misfolding of proteins. So it's no surprise that within us, our cells, we basically spend a huge amount of what you might call the capacity of a cell to maintain itself is spent to try to maintain the health of the proteome. And this is through chaperones, and I'll say more about, and degradation networks. Um, and so basically this is all part of what we can call protein homeostasis or proteostasis networks. And if you think about what's going on in, in our bodies at all times, the thing is that we can't avoid challenges to the health of the proteome. And this is an incomplete list, but even from the starting point, biosynthesis is imperfect. And so one can get misincorporations, you can get truncations, you get lots of things that lead to um, the protein product being, uh, having mistakes in it. Stress can be a variety of different kinds of stress from oxidative to thermal. You have the possibility of mutations, somatic mutations, um, or mutations that get incorporated into the genome, just polymorphisms. There are functional requirements for proteins to be dynamic and not to be rocks, because if they're rocks, they can't undergo conformational changes that are needed for function. Um, there are functions that actually require proteins to fully unfold, and that the examples given here are translocation across a membrane, in many cases requires the protein to be completely unfolded. Um, and then there's the one that, that some of us are really sad about, which is that that we really seem to lose over the aging process, the capacity to withstand these stresses and uh, counteract them. So what is our system for counteracting them? I'm not gonna talk, there are many people working on the degradation systems on campus, but I'm gonna talk about the chaperone roles. If you think about protein folding, we now think about energy landscapes that have the native fold generally as the lowest energy state. But as a protein folds, it can visit intermediate states. And some of these are reasonably long lived. And if these partially folded states are reasonably long lived, they are exposing hydrophobic surface and they're susceptible to aggregation, as I mentioned. Chaperones can do two things that you can illustrate on these funnels. They can either help a protein to dwell for a shorter period of time in um, partially folded states or they can in fact block in a direct way, inhibit aggregation. They can also break up aggregates. Um, and so these are all things that, that the network of protein homeostasis machinery is doing. And it's not a surprise that this is a very 
um, fulsome and complex set of constituents and reactions that are at all times trying to maintain the health of the proteome. Um, what I want to say to you is even though there are a lot of um, species and uh, this cast of characters is complex, one of the fascinating things is that you have basically one protein homeostasis network for all the proteins in the cell. So they have to handle a lot of what we call clients so that any given chaperone is going to be able to recognize many, many different proteins and facilitate their folding. And this is one of the puzzles that underlies a lot of the work we do in my lab. So in our lab, um, we think that the HSP70 system is the heart of the protein homeostasis network. It is an early component of this network that greets nascent chains when they come off the ribosome and helps um, early stages in folding and avoid aggregation early on or premature folding. And they hand off from the 70 um, networks, one sees handoff to downstream chaperones, including HSP90s um, and um, basically in, in some systems, the HSP110 small heat shock proteins Elizabeth Veerling works on that are around as well and work in teams with these chaperones. But the 70s, when you think about them, they basically have, through a rather simple molecular machine, deceptively simple, we can say, they can do the processes that I alluded to, like greeting the nascent chain and helping it to avoid trouble early on. They can help proteins to be unfolded so that they get across membranes. They can help prevent misfolding. They can help disaggregation and working in teams with other, cha other chaperones. Um, and they can, in all likelihood, directly facilitate folding. But remember, they're going to do this for a number of different clients. So there has to be something about their function that is applicable despite the, very, the variety of sequence that they confront. So what they are, in fact, is an allosteric machine. And their allosteric cycle allows them to um, cycle between a high affinity state that is nucleotide modulated such that ADP binding leads to high affinity for substrate. ATP binding lowers that affinity and the substrate is released. Um, they work with co-chaperones, one of which facilitates the substrate release and ATPase activity, and other facilitates cycling between ADP to the ATP state. And this allosteric cycle means they're kind of like two-stroke engines. They either bind or release, or bind or release their clients. And what good is that? Well, if you think about it, if you took a rope, and rope's not a very good model because it doesn't want to coil up on its own, but if you took um, a linear object that had a spontaneous tendency to collapse, if you grab onto parts of it, which is what the HSP70 does, you can grab and let go and grab and let go and you prevent it from folding. So they basically um, limit the rate of folding and they can hold on to misfolded or partially folded states so that they don't get into trouble. Um, so this is uh, pretty simple stuff, except as a molecule, it's not understanding its mechanism is not that simple. So the three little vignettes I'm going to give you today um, are basically questions that we've been asking about this machine and how it does its functions. The first one is basically we can draw that cycle, but can we relate it now to structural details of how allosteric works? How does it go between these two conformations? So that's the first one. The second one is a, a kind of a ramification of that. If you think in an energy landscape world, I showed you two endpoints and I showed you kind of a middle. Is the middle a state or not? And the reason that that is one of the case studies that I want to talk with you about is that it relied heavily on our core facilities. Answering that question did. And then the last, which is stuff that's ongoing in the lab, is that these chaperones work on many substrates. So how is it that they can interact with promiscuity because they don't care in a way what the identity of their client is. And yet they have some selectivity because they bind to incompletely folded things. So how does the uh, selective promiscuity work? And 
in terms of our cores, we rely heavily on NMR. You saw a lot of NMR posters out there, including from my lab. Um, and it was key to us that we have good, high quality, high uh, resolution NMR to work out the molecular mechanism. And in terms of understanding whether that's, there's an allosterically active state, we relied heavily on mass spec. And then in terms of the interaction with substrates, the biophysical core and the NMR core both helped us. So if you think about the structural way that this machine works, there are basically two extreme endpoints. In ATP bound state, we draw this nucleotide binding domain. It's a two domain protein in blue. The substrate binding domain has a green part and a red part, the beta fold and for the green part and a helical lid. In the low affinity state, these two are, uh, these parts are all co collapsed on one another in very intimate interactions in the presence of ATP. When ADP is found, the two domains are quite independent. The helical lid lies over the beta subdomain and the substrate binding uh, is high affinity and in essence also kind of locked in, the substrate is kind of locked in. Um, these are crystal structures, uh, they're two domain separate structures for the two domains in the ADP state. But what's amazing about this is that just the simple presence of the gamma phosphate makes this conformational change happen. And the question is how? And when I say it's a large conformational change, this movie makes it very clear that to get from that low affinity state or from the high affinity state, if you think of that as the starting when the two domains are separate, to the low affinity state is a huge conformational change. Simple presence of a gamma phosphate gets you there. So how does it do it? Well, the two domains have properties that allow them to be sensitive to ligands. And it, it, this, in work that was started by Anastasia Zurvleva uh, in my lab in collaboration with Eugenia Clerico, who's been involved in all of this work, um, we were able to show by NMR that when one looks at the difference between ADP bound and ATP bound nucleotide binding domain, the blue domain, you have this, it's an actin fold, if any of you are familiar, and you have subdomains within that structure around the, there are two lobes and four subdomains, and they undergo a conformational rearrangement in response to the presence of the gamma phosphate that chemical shift perturbations between these two states reveal big time. So if you paint onto the structure the biggest chemical shift changes. It turns out the gamma phosphate pushes on a little beta sheet and actually causes the two, these two crossing helices at the base to change their orientation and lead to this overall subdomain reorientation. It's just amazing. This at the same time opens and closes a pocket and the linker between the two domains can dock into that pocket only when ATP is bound. So you have the beginnings of allosteri shown to you by the way the chemical shift perturbations point to conformational change in that domain. So once you have the linker docked in there, you have to communicate that to the other domain. Well, it turns out, I'm not gonna give you all the chapter and verse on this, um, but the other domain also has two possible conformations and they open and close, this is just the beta part, the, the substrate binding site. And when they're opening and closing it, visiting these two alternate conformations, you'll notice that the side of the substrate binding domain that faces the nucleotide binding domain undergoes a pretty big conformational change. And as it turns out, one of those fits and can pack against the nucleotide binding domain, and the other one can't. And the one that can is the low affinity. So there's a cooperative conformational change so that when the nucleotide binding domain is ATP bound, it presents an interface, and the substrate binding domain can fit that interface only when you open up the substrate binding site. So this is, this is the essence of allosteri in this protein. And there are three parts that I just told you about in my talk, talking about it, but you remodel the interface so that they fit together in the ATP bound state, and that's only when the substrate binding domain is in its low substrate affinity state. The inner domain linker, I mentioned there's a pocket that's opened up on the nucleotide binding domain, and only when there's ATP bound to the nucleotide binding domain, there's a hydrophobic 
sequence that can dock into that domain. And the helical lid is another part of allosteric because it can either interact with the beta subdomain in the high affinity state when it clamps the substrate, or it can come up here and form an interface with the nucleotide binding domain. So all the parts have like two choices, but if you make those two choices cooperative, then you favor two allosteric states. So we call these basically allosteric couplers, the, the components that interact with one domain or the other. Um, and this is, we believe, the origin of allosteric. Um, there's a, a twist, and the, so that, by the way, illustrates how NMR and basically high field NMR that can allow you to look at a 70 kilodalton protein with, we had to use a lot of carbon and to, to get the, the adequate resolution and um, be able to identify the conformational changes, although in the, nucle in the domains alone, you could do straightforward um, proton uh, nitrogen. But there's an allosteric truism, which is that you want to measure the allosteric of this machine. And what you want is to show that the presence of ATP modulates substrate affinity. Or binding of substrate modulates the ATP hydrolysis rate. Those are two domain communication assays. But in order to do that, if you think about it, you have ATP present and you measure substrate affinity. That means both ATP and substrate are there. <coughs> Similarly, if you want to activate the ATPase, you add substrate. Again, both of those are present. And I just showed you like these two endpoints where you just had ATP and the substrate couldn't bind, or you had substrate bound and ADP bound. What happens if they're both there? And if they're both there, basically, if you think of an energy landscape, you've got these two allosteric states, the high affinity and the low affinity. Do you really have a state in between? The problem with this in terms of biophysical instrumentation is that you can do carbon NMR, methyl carbon NMR. And we use an ATPase deficient version of the protein so we can add ATP. And you can see chemical shift changes. And we see that there is a state when ATP and substrate bind. However, for those of you that have been paying attention in your physical chemistry classes, you know that NMR has a very slow time scale. And as a consequence, you often see averages. And if we see that chemical shift change in the middle, we don't know if it's the consequence of going back and forth between the two endpoints. So we see the average. Or is it really a state? And so we needed methods that would, have a, would be faster. We could show that there is something going on, but the question is, is this actually visited, this arrangement that's partway between the two? Um, so in order to get to that, uh, it turns out that we could take advantage of some very fancy mass spectrometry equipment, which we have here, ion mobility mass spec. We actually did it collaboratively at the time um, when we didn't yet have our ion mobility here. Um, but ion mobility floats your ions through um, the, a chamber that has an inert gas in it. And so as they move through, if they have a big cross section, they're going to bump into more of the inert gas. If they have a small cross section, they will bump into less. That's called the collision cross section. It's like walking down a sidewalk with a lot of people. And if you make yourself thin, you can get there faster. If you have your arms out, you get there slower. So you can get a measurement of the arrival time of your ions that reports on the size of the molecule if you do native mass spectrometry. So this is the native molecule. So we could then compare, and this was Eugenia Clerico spearheaded this, we could compare what we thought were the two endpoints, but does the middle does it have a unique size that's revealed by its collision cross-section? And in fact, as it turns out, it did. And this, the analysis of the data was tricky, but we see an allosterically active state that exists in the mix that has a size that is intermediate between the two-domain bigger cross-section and the collapsed ATP-bound state. And so that told us this was indeed a state. And we actually did this by also by electron spin resonance, um, double electron spin resonance in collaboration with people at Cornell. But I wanted to 
showcase the fact that mass spec has this information embedded in your ion mobility uh, experiments. So that told us the answer to the second question that I put up the, for the vignette, which is that we have the two endpoint structures, and we do indeed have a state visited that we think of as kind of in pain. It's not a very stable state because the ligands are each trying to pull it towards one of those endpoints. So they're in competition energetically. The interfaces that are formed are not as solidly formed as they are in the two um, endpoints. So the last question that I told you we were um, working on currently in the lab quite a bit is motivated by the fact that the chaperone has to bind many different clients. And so we want to understand as best we can what we call the selective promiscuity. How do you recognize all these different clients in the proteome, but yet you don't bind everything? You only bind species that are incompletely folded. Incompletely folded species usually expose some hydrophobic stuff. And so you expect that the HSP70s will bind hydrophobic things. And indeed, that's the case. Um, I didn't show you details of how they bind substrate. I think I have a picture coming. But they bind a little extended piece, just like my analogy of binding onto a rope. They basically grab onto a fairly linear piece that has some hydrophobic stuff. Well, that satisfies a lot of people, but we weren't satisfied. We wanted to know how that was achieved in a greater detailed view. So what we did was to take a protein substrate this is the precursor of alkaline phosphatase that normally gets secreted to the periplasm of E. coli. And it's a, it's a good biophysical substrate. It's big. It's 450 residues. There was work done that pointed out five possible binding sites using peptide array, but not on the protein, on peptide pieces um, to, to HSP70. And so we thought, we'll go ahead and we'll try to delve deeply into the binding of those sites and look at the protein itself and see how it's bound. And this is really the, the cliff notes of this study. It just came out in uh, PNAS uh, last year. So we had to first make peptides that corresponded to those potential binding sites. And then we measured their affinities. Well, here's the biophysical characterization core. And then we use x-ray crystallography. Here's the biophysical characterization core to measure the structures, to determine the structures of the complexes between the HSP70 and the peptides. And then we use NMR to determine in solution what their binding modes are, again, using methyl NMR. So the peptides that we made are shown here, and the binding affinities are shown over here. And I'll show you how we measured them in a moment. Um, but they're all different lengths because we had to, if you've worked with peptides that have a lot of hydrophobic character, they're not very soluble. So the pieces we designed have the sites that were proposed from the peptide array and a little bit of spinach on the sides to make them more soluble and well-behaved. And in a couple of cases, a cysteine so that we can add a fluorophore, for example. Um, then the binding assay that we rely on heavily is fluorescence anisotropy, which many of you may have used. But if you put a fluorophore on a small molecule like this and you, do, you measure the anisotropy, how long a polarized beam maintains the polarization when you look at the fluorescence coming off, and if it binds to a larger entity and tumbles slower, it stays polarized longer. Okay, So it's a way of asking whether your small molecule, the peptide, is bound to a larger entity. We rely often on competition because basically we don't want to make a fluorescently labeled version of every peptide we're going to study. So we take one as a reference, and we kick it off and see how much of the others you need to kick it off. And so the data that you get out of an assay like that are shown here. And these curves are competition assays with all of the different peptide sites that I mentioned. And you get binding affinities out. They're in the fractions of a micromolar. So depending on your view in life, that's high or low affinity. Um, anybody that's really worked with high affinity you're usually used to nanomolar. This is not as tight as that. Um, and that has implications for function. So then we want to go ahead and know how the peptides bind in detail. Well, happily, you can do crystal structures and get the detailed binding. Here's the extended peptide bound to the substrate binding domain, looking down on it, the binding site from the top, having taken the helix off. And you can see details of how the side chains interact with the, the chaperone. But the biggest thing you can see is that this chaperone, promiscuity, is its name. Because 
it's binding one of these in one direction of the peptide chain and the other one in the other direction. This was a real wake-up call to the field, that this chaperone doesn't care what the orientation of the polypeptide substrate is. It can actually bind to a site in either orientation. It makes five hydrogen bonds that are really part of the integral to the structure in either case. In one case, it, if you think about your um, secondary structure of proteins, there's a parallel beta strand, beta strand interaction. In the other, there's an anti-parallel beta strand, beta strand interaction. And they both can make good hydrogen bonds. So it turns out that it can do, it can do this and d sh tells us that in the crystal. But we really want to know in solution, was that something that just came about because we crystallized these guys together and they found a structure that was stable in the crystal lattice? So we then turn again to NMR. And as uh, nature's been kind to us, there are two isoleucines that are buried right next to where the substrate binds. And their methyl chemical shifts are extraordinarily sensitive to the nature of the peptide that's bound. And in fact, it turns out to the orientation. And I'll just show you the bottom line. These are all those peptides, A, B, C, D, E, that I showed you. You can remember by color if you want. Uh, and their positions in a methyl proton two-dimensional NMR spectrum. And for the two isoleucines in the substrate binding domain of the HSP70, it's a stunningly broad array of chemical shifts. And they group, because we did enough peptides, they group in terms of which residues in the central pocket of the binding site, which n loves leucine, but will tolerate valine or isoleucine, or for that matter, proline. And you get a different chemical shift. So valine or proline, the um, carbon chemical shift is way up here, isoleucine here, leucine here. In addition, these regions subdivide depending on the orientation. And that required some biochemical cleverness to figure out the orientation, which I can answer if you want, but, or you can read the paper. But it, we, we figured out N to C or C to N and then we came up with this, what I think of as a fingerprint diagram that is incredibly useful now if you look at a new substrate and you want to know how it's binding. But the holy grail we wanted was to go back to the protein and see whether what we're learning on peptides applies on the protein. And so basically this is showing that that is absolutely the case. This is an unfolded protein. When you look at the titration now of increasing amounts of the chaperone, onto the protein. And you see the signature of the isoleucines that are present in the chaperone. And you can see the signals coming up for the different binding sites as the chaperone starts to occupy them. What it tells us is many things. First of all, all the sites that we looked at as peptides are being used in the protein. So it's behaving like in, a, in an additive way that it will, the chaperone will look for these sites and behave just as it does with peptides. There's a hierarchy of affinity that we saw with the peptides, and that's the order in which the chaperone binds. So it's, uh, the, it's looking for the highest affinity binding sites, binding to them. And in addition, the orientation is conserved, as it was in the peptides. So the chaperone comes and it looks for the highest affinity, starts occupying those sites. You can have multiple chaperones on one substrate. And you get this hierarchical with orientation um, not caring. Uh, and uh, we do see one new site that we hope, if you asked us in a year, we'll know what it is. It didn't come up on the peptide array. And so we don't know what it is. We have hypotheses. But otherwise, it's the same exact sites. So it's a, it's a picture of the binding of these um, sites by the chaperone. And, when we interpret that in detail, these are the sites that bind. These are the orientations that we see. We get multiple modes of binding to the same site. So for example, I'll just point out B. The chaperone binds it in either an end to C or a C to N direction. So you get a multiplicity of binding arrangements. And the picture then tells us what promiscuity is about. The chaperone doesn't really care very much. It's, it's able to bind to a lot of different sites. And the energy difference between the binding sites, very small. The selectivity, it certainly has, and I, I could just try to drive the point home, but if you look at these 
subsites on the chaperone. Again, this is a, a feeble pointer, but minus three, minus two, minus one, zero. These are the sites on the chaperone where the side chains go. The minus three, minus two, minus one, you'll notice they're almost all greasy, whereas the others are much more varied. So that's the, the selectivity combined with promiscuity. And then the image you should walk away with is that this is a fluctuating dynamic situation. The chaperone can bind and release, bind and release, and shop around for sites that are the highest affinity sites. What's the consequence of that? Well, that chain ain't gonna fold. It's being nibbled at all over by the chaperone and not allowed for any parts to get together and start to fold. Um, if that was the goal, that would be the end of it. It would maintain an unfolded state. That might be true for translocation across a membrane. But other, other processes like folding, you might imagine it has to let go. But it will let go the low affinity states first. There may be an order that has evolved to facilitate a mechanism of folding. So this is something we're testing right now. There's a handoff to a downstream chaperone, so HSP90 could be lurking. And when there's release, the chain could go to the next chaperone, um, et cetera. So the, you can see how this way of working can be tuned to the functions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit there. I want to make sure that the people that are in the lab now who are in the top up here, the, a lot of the work you saw, uh, Eugenia has just been spearheading all along, but there's a team in the lab, the people that, whose pictures are here, people who've been in the lab are in the next group, and some of our collaborators are in the group on the bottom. And I just want to say, you know, I, I, I gave you a little tour through this journey we've been on as a campus. It's been a really busy and productive 10 years, and I really want to thank the people that slaved to spend the money. It was tough, but we had to do it. Um, anyway, we worked tirelessly, and that's for sure. And now I think the whole campus has benefited. Our own science has benefited tremendously. And so I hear there's the ammunition for celebration out there. So um, that's what I think we should do next. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. And that was a quick tour. So um, I'm, I'm here. But I also know we've got other stuff coming. So um, <laughs> a small gift to, to oh, thank you as you go. And hopefully you have some shelf space left for a little bit more. For wow. Our inaugural speaker of the Core Facility Seminar Series. We hope we'll have uh, quite a few more, but uh, hopefully oh, there's cool. shelf space for that. Wow, um, thank you. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs>